from the Isra, the part of the journey of, of Muhammad from Mecca to Jerusalem. And once in Jerusalem, the second part of the journey, the Miraj, and, uh, where he toured the seven stages of heaven and spoke with the earlier prophets. According to Islamic tradition, God instructed Muhammad that Muslims press pray 50 times a day, however, Moses, Musa, told Muhammad that it would be very difficult for the people and urged Muhammad to ask for a reduction until finally it was reduced to five times a day. Moshe Dayan understood very well the potential volatility of the site when he ordered that an Israeli flag, flag raised on the Dome of Rock be immediately removed. Israel then understood that if it attempted to change the status quo there, it could bring about an explosion throughout the Middle East and the Muslim world. In those days, we were all very fortunate because the overwhelming majority of mainstream rabbis, including the official chief rabbinate of the state of Israel, determined that since we did not know the exact location of the Holy of Holies and the Holy Temple, Jews should not ascend to the Temple Mount at all. According to Jewish tradition, when the Messiah comes, the Temple will be rebuilt, then Jews could once again pray on the Temple Mount. In recent years, more Jews combining deep religious beliefs with extreme nationalism have decided that Jews should retake the mount even before the Messiah comes, perhaps as a way of speeding up his coming. The demand of Jews to be allowed to pray there is understandable from a position of religious importance and is an assertion of rights of free access to holy places. If there was no conflict between Israel and Palestine, it could, be even it could even be possible to imagine the day when this could happen peacefully. There is no prohibition in Islamic law, in Sharia, to people of other faiths praying on the Haram al-Sharif. But in the situation of conflict where the Muslims in Palestine and in the Muslim world are convinced that Israel's intentions are to remove the mosques, prevent Muslims from praying there, and rebuild the temple, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict instantly becomes transformed from a political conflict into a religious war. This is the most dangerous scenario possible and too risky to support. The status quo must be maintained, and if it is to be changed, it should be only be done through negotiations and agreement and not imposed by force. So the political solution for the Temple Mount Haram al-Sharif is to formalize the status quo, whereby the Muslims control the Temple Mount Haram al-Sharif on top, and Israel controls the western wall below, outside of the mount where Jews now pray, as close to the mount as possible. Both parties would agree to limit their sovereignty and control by not tunneling, constructing, digging, or damaging the entire compound without mutual agreement. If after the Messiah comes, God should desire to change the arrangement, everything could then be possible for the time being the making of an agreement are possible by formalizing the status quo. Can it work? So now we're left with two main questions. How can the city of Jerusalem be politically divided on the basis of demography and still function? And when should the issue be negotiated? The only way that Jerusalem can survive as an urban space where real people live and work is for it to remain physically united and open. Jerusalem will die if it is torn to pieces with walls and barbed wire fences. The precondition for Jerusalem to be undivided physically and open is for, to be, for there to be real personal security within the city. This is a precondition for all aspects of Israeli-Palestinian peace. Real security in Jerusalem will have to include three main components. Each side, security and police forces will have to take full responsibility for security and law and order within the territory under their own domain. Two, there will be a need for a very robust active cooperation, including joint forces between the Israeli and Palestinian security and peace forces and Jerusalem, police forces in Jerusalem. And three, Lastly, there, needs, there must be a significant third-party monitoring component ensuring that both parties are fully implementing their obligations as well as assisting in building the trust necessary for the joint missions and providing a real-time, on-the-ground dispute resolution mechanisms. Lastly, when should Jerusalem be negotiated? At the end or in the beginning of negotiations? Going against conventional wisdom, I have always advocated putting Jerusalem on the top of the table front, up front. Borders, can be, borders cannot be negotiated without arriving to Jerusalem. Land swaps are meaningless without dealing with the delineation of borders and sovereignty in Jerusalem. Security arrangements have little validity, validity without confronting security in Jerusalem, where the most terror attacks took place during the Second Intifada. 
National symbols and holy places cannot be dealt with anywhere in the area without dealing with Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the microcosm of the entire conflict and the most sensitive issue on the table. If the issues in conflict in Jerusalem can be resolved in negotiations, all other aspects of the negotiations will be resolved. If Jerusalem cannot be resolved, there can be no Israeli-Palestinian peace. Since most aspects of Jerusalem and Israel have been negotiating in the past, and since there have been so many workable proposals designed for Jerusalem by Israeli and Palestinian experts who have worked together on finding them, it is more possible to reach an agreement on Jerusalem than most people believe. The solutions are described above enable both sides to have their national capitals in Jerusalem. Jerusalem will remain an open United City for all to come and visit while clearly designating separate sovereignties on maps and on the ground. Jerusalem's holy places will be open with free access to all and each community will remain will attain control control over its most sacred spaces while enabling dreams and future aspirations to remain within the realm of prayer. Peace in Jerusalem is the key to Israeli-Palestinian peace. The key is on the table and waiting to be used. Jerusalem has the potential to become one of the place, one place in the world where civilizations do not clash, but learn to appreciate each other through dialogue, through mutual respect, and through mutual and collective celebration. Jerusalem's uniqueness is its spiritual calling and its rich human resources. The wealth of Jerusalem comes from those who hold it dear and from those whose lives are connected to it. The fostering of conflicts in the city and about the city through the empty political slogans on billboards and bus sides cheapens Jerusalem's value. The competition over Jerusalem's meager land resources increase the ugliness and the rudeness in the city's character and outer face. Jerusalem's history is a huge burden. That burden has been the weight that has reduced Jerusalem's glory to a primitive tribal feud which has driven too many good people out of the city. When Jerusalem's present and its future potential outshines its past, without losing respect and appreciation of its past, then Jerusalem will be a magnet instead of being a burden. Lastly, it must be said here at a conference sponsored by the United Nations that the recent decision made by UNESCO that essentially erased any Jewish connection to Jerusalem is neither educated nor scientific. It was outright ignorance and wrong. UNESCO and the entire United Nations becomes a hindrance to peace and not an enabler when it decides to ignore the Jewish history and presence in Jerusalem. It would be more than wise for the United Nations to reverse that decision, and it would be extremely intelligent intelligent if it was the delegation of Palestine to the United Nations that led that decision. Thank you. And with that challenge, I thank Mr. Bashkin for his presentation. Your interventions are always challenging our assumptions and are thought-provoking. Thank you once again. The ideas you have presented on how the issue of Jerusalem can be permanently settled are very valuable. Our next speaker is Ms. Catherine Sisse of Senegal. She is a prominent expert and researcher in the field of conflict resolution. She engaged more than 50 scholars from conflict regions in producing shared historical narratives. <coughs> She practiced international human, humanitarian law at the ad hoc tribunals for the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda and the ICC. She also served as an expert on human rights for the Commission of the European Union. We are pleased to have you, Madam, and you now have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, good afternoon, Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I will speak in French, don't worry. This is French is my mother language. Um, the advantage of speaking last in a conference as rich as this one is that you, everything has been said beforehand, so my presentation will uh, be uh, limited. Nonetheless, I 
I wanted to uh, talk to you today about an experience, an experience that I had while working on the history of Israel, of Palestine, of the Israelo-Palestinian conflict, and the uh, year 1948, which is uh, very important, historically speaking. Now, first of all, I would like to express my whole gratitude to uh, the committee, chairman of the committee for the inalienable rights of the Palestinian uh, people and the Islamic Conference uh, for organizing this conference on Jerusalem. It is for me an honor and a pleasure to speak this afternoon in my country on a topic which is so close to my heart. I do not, cannot no longer count the, my, the number of visits that I made to Jerusalem, both east and west and out of Jerusalem. The question of the legal status of Jerusalem, as demonstrated by previous speakers, is capital in the resolution of the conflict. The concretization of a Palestinian state is, is Jerusalem as a capital city is unavoidable. One has to unfortunately note that this complex question, which uh, relates, which is based on international law and a determined action of the international community and the political will of the parties concerned is very far from being resolved. The present situation which prevails in East Jerusalem and, under the other, and in the other occupied territories is very serious. The dead end that we find ourselves in leads to despair and sometimes suicidal violence. The future of the Palestinian youth born and living under occupation is uh, heavy. This future is marked by socioeconomic discriminations, arbitrary arrests, and extrajudiciary executions. How can we tolerate that more and more teenagers, boys, uh, aged between 12 and 13 years, are being jailed in the, by Israel in full violation of Israeli law and international law? Our responsibility, the responsibility of all of us, is to offer the youth reasons to hope and to give them the ways of building their future. Franklin Roosevelt used to say that the role of educators is to train future generations so that they can build their own future and not to write the future for them. Uh, funnily enough, such a process, such a process requires our uh, turning back to the past, no matter how heavy and painful it is, to identify the historical truth. I'm talking about historical truth in the plural, because as we have seen and heard, there is not one single histor uh, historical truth. And such historical truth will make it possible to know and understand the present within a more open prospect and to set the landmarks for a lasting solution. On the basis of this analysis, it will then be possible to also turn our heads to the future and map out out what could be tomorrow, um, what, what tomorrow could be if a fair and lasting solution is found. If a light appears in the darker part of the tunnel, it will be possible to turn to it and nourish the hope of those uh, who refuse fatalism. This double movement towards the past and the future will help feed world solidarity, the political will of the international community, and the mobilization of youth who live in Jerusalem and throughout the world and aiming for a universal Jerusalem. The shattered identities uh, shaped by the abusive use and lies of the past must disappear to leave way to new identities based on knowledge, truth, and empathy, respect for the other. The other one is not uh, an enemy. The objective of my presentation is to analyze, well, try, attempt to analyze in what way such a project of a, based on a common approach to history, a shared narrative, is more telling how such a, an approach would be possible in the case of Jerusalem, how we can transform Jerusalem into a place of shared memory, both for Israelis and Palestinians, with 
uh, open uh, physical and mental space. Allow me to tell you about the experience I had while working with Israeli and Palestinian historians on the year 1948, Nakba for the Palestinians, the uh, independence uh, of Israel for the Israelis. For many years, joint teams of Israelis and Palestinians had first to reach and could reach an agreement on the facts that marked 1948. Now they started agreeing on the fact, and then they uh, addressed the memory conflicts uh, stemming from wrong interpretation, and this is where the difficulty comes in. That is how to reconcile those different and opposed interpretations of memories. Now, through debates and discussions and the willingness to produce a peaceful future, those historians manage to uh, have a meeting of minds. They couldn't agree on everything because one has, doesn't have, should not be naive. But they managed to reach some points of agreement. One of them, Professor Moti Golani, agreed that the exercise was difficult, but that it changed deeply uh, his mind and was therapeutic in that it made it possible for him to deconstruct his Zionist vision and agree with what his uh, counterpart, Dr. Abdel Manel, was saying. Adel and Mote are today friends, and from Ramallah, Halifa, Jerusalem, East and West, Stockholm, Brussels, share their uh, experience. They are wonderful examples of committed historians. Dr. Hihab Sahul, a brilliant academic from Gaza, and his counterpart, Dr. Tamir Sorek, together with their elders, Professor Sami Adwan, Professor Menahem Klein, Professor Mahmoud Yasbag and Dr. Efrat Benzev addressed the question of Palestinian refugees in 1948 from an original angle by having students from Palestine and Israel participate in the process. From this modest experience, I drew the following conclusions. It is important for historians to work together in a peaceful environment, if possible, out of the region. Secondly, the moderator should uh, preferably be an impartial, uh, an impartial and foreign uh, Person. Thirdly, it should be. It is important to that understanding what the other is saying does not mean that you make everything legitimate. But by so doing, the cast the basis for the dialogue and reconciliation. It is also important for dissemination of the works be targeted. In the case in point, we are talking about uh, students and educators. Some people will say that this exercise of cross vision is only meaningful when the conflict is resolved. Others will be of the view, on the contrary, that the duty to restitute the historical truth should be borne in mind from now on in the research, in the search for a lasting peace by national and international actors. And here I'm going to mention a taboo word, reconciliation, having also worked in areas where the past uh, is still, unfortunately, uh, very difficult to accept uh, on either side. I'm thinking about the Turks, the Armenians, I'm thinking about the former Yugoslavia. This word reconciliation is often banned. It is often banned, but I think that reconciliation is possible. As uh, I think it, uh, his name, the name was Mary, uh, when she was talking about reconciliation, by placing the human being at the heart of the issue. The need to get the youth of Jerusalem involved in an archaeological work on the memory, work on the past, is justified by the fact, as we have heard, that the population of East Jerusalem is young, 
by majority that the knowledge of the history of the city of Jerusalem uh, has a lot of gaps and that the youth of West Jerusalem are just as ignorant of the historic heritage of Jerusalem. Such ignorance is also shared at the international level. The impact of such shortcomings is shown by the predominance of exclusive and wrong stories that pollute the city of Jerusalem. It would therefore be useful to counter that phenomenon uh, through the knowledge and dissemination of the rich history of Jerusalem based on a plural, plural uh, and uh, at uh, different levels, a multi-layered approach. Educating the youth, in particular on the complex history of Jerusalem, will enhance the link of belonging to that city, a link which is shattered by the reality of occupation and violence, the uh, uh, exposition of the youth of Jerusalem to the multiplicity of histories of the different communities of the city would have a positive impact on the relationship between Israeli and Palestinian youth. The international community has here an important role to play. It could facilitate the preparation of an encyclopedia of Jerusalem inspired by a joint group of Israeli and Palestinian historian inspired by uh, the publication of the history of Africa under the aegis of uh, UNESCO and published by, Kizer, Kizer, by Dr. Kizerbu. Such encyclopedia should be available online because we are talking about the youth here. And reading a book is unfortunately not the best way of touching the youth. So let us use the social uh, networks. The commu international community could also facilitate the development of pedagogical tools for the professors and teachers of history, particularly at the secondary school level. There should be a watchdog mechanism uh, to watch over the social medias that are propagating hatred. I'm always shattered. My knowledge of Arabic and Hebrew is very limited, but uh, the 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 uh, proportion of uh, 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 lies, uh, uh, preconceived ideas is such that in international criminal law, uh, the dissemination of such measures uh, could be liable to instation to hatred and um, could be assimilated to a crime. Now, uh, facilitate the international community could facilitate facilitate the establishment of an inter interactive and attractive website for the youth on the history of their streets, neighborhoods, families, the history of the monuments of Jerusalem, the holy places, the holy shrines, and uh, it should also promote uh, documentary films, artistic works, and cultural works that would underline the uh, multifaceted aspect of Jerusalem. It should facilitate uh, the um, uh, appointment of a special rapporteur on the cultural rights. Um, uh, so there was a book written on the negative impact of uh, school books written under, uh, which are based on an ultra-nationalistic uh, ideology. The challenge is sizable, but it is only at that uh, cost that the memories of Jerusalem will be reconciled and that the, the whole world uh, would uh, mobilize around the face of its spiritual cradle. Now, uh, right was saying, Jerusalem must envisage its future on the basis of the concept of, sh open, of sharing open to the true sovereign state, a capital for two states. I do thank you. I would like to thank Madam Sisse for the presentation and for a tireless effort to upholding international law and human rights. Your thoughts on promoting reconciliation and healing in Jerusalem are very timely. On behalf of the committee, I would like to express once again our deep appreciation for taking the time out 
of your busy schedule to be joining us here today. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, we had the last speaker on our list. We would now start our discussions. Participants are welcome to ask questions or make short comments on the presentations you have just had. We shall take comments or questions from the audience, and then our speakers will have the time and opportunity to respond. Please, before you take the floor, identify yourself at the beginning and keep your questions or comments very brief so that we can take as many uh, of the audience as possible. I'm tempted to have fielded a couple of questions in advance, but um, judging on the interest you have shown this morning in fielding so many questions and comments, I wouldn't do so in order not to take too much of your time. So I would allow you and invite your questions and comments for as long as they are brief. The floor is now open. Maybe we should take uh, a list of identifications and then we'll go according